Well, welcome everyone. This is the first time we're doing things this way. My name is Dr. Gerard Pregenzer Jr. Uh, I'm a board certified urologist. I'm the founder and uh, director of ED Specialists of Connecticut. That's part of the Greater Hartford Urology Group, which is part of Prime Healthcare. We operate primarily in central Connecticut. This is the first time we're live streaming, so bear with me as I just make sure that we're actually up and running here. Perfect. I just got confirmation from one of my offsite production crew that apparently we are live. Great. So normally I like to give community talks in which I, I talk to uh, a group of men and, and their partners about uh, men's health issues. Uh, something that I talk a lot about is, uh, is uh, ED. Um, and that's a particular passion of mine because I've seen how much it can really damage uh, men's lives, how it can damage their relationships. I see it lead to things like terrible, terrible depression. I've seen it lead to broken marriages, broken families, um, and it's not just a physical thing. It's not just the ED itself. It's what it does to a man's psyche. Um, now, look, some men deal with it just fine, but some, it, it's really, really difficult. Um, and so tonight, uh, I would like to, uh, again, for the first time um, on a web-based platform, try to take this to a broader audience. Uh, I know that everybody uh, is probably at home tonight. Staying safe and healthy, and uh, what better time uh, than now for a little bit of education on, on health issues. Okay, so again, the following presentation contains educational information that some may consider graphic, and viewer discretion is advised. So we're going to be talking about men's health, the signs, symptoms, and treatment options for erectile dysfunction. Again, this is me, Dr. Gerard Pregenzer, Jr. Uh, I specialize in urology and prosthetic urology, uh, as well as general urology, male infertility, male sexual dysfunction. Uh, I did my doctorate of medicine at New Jersey Medical School down in Newark, New Jersey. I did my residency right here in Connecticut at the UConn School of Medicine. Now, we do have multiple offices in my practice, and typically we'll, we'll staff locations um, sort of throughout central Connecticut. But right now, due to the COVID-19 pan, uh, pandemic, we, uh, we've separated ourselves, and so now we are isolated all in the se separate offices. We don't rotate through at least for the next month or so. So for right now, I am occupying the office at number nine Cranbrook Boulevard on the second floor. That's up in Enfield, Connecticut. You can reach me at 860-522-2251. That's the general office number. And you can always find me at www.hartfordedcure.com. So what is ED? Who has it and what causes it? We'll get into that tonight. So ED is defined as the persistent inability to achieve or maintain an erection firm enough for sexual intercourse. And this is very, very common. A lot of guys think they're alone. They're not. Approximately one in five American men over the age of 20 years old will experience ED at some point in their lifetime. And more than half of men over the age of 40 have some degree of erectile dysfunction. This affects approximately 39 million American men. So here's how an erection works. When aroused, the nerves surrounding the penis become active. Muscles around the arteries then relax and more blood flows into the penis. The additional blood makes the penis stiff and hard or erect. This erection then tightens the veins so the blood can't leave the penis, enabling the penis to remain erect. Now ED is very strongly correlated with other major medical conditions. Top three physical causes of ED include uh, vascular disease, diabetes, and certain medications. Now, what I'll tell you is that in my practice, one of the biggest things I see is diabetes. That's really, really bad for ED. Uh, and in particular, it can make uh, the oral medications for ED really not work. 
Now, ED can also be a result or an early warning sign of things like prostate cancer or prostate cancer treatment, diabetes, and heart disease. Let's talk a little bit about ED and low testosterone. Low testosterone, sometimes referred to as hypogonadism or low T, occurs when a man's body produces less testosterone than normal. Decreases in testosterone may increase the risk of sexual dysfunction, body composition, and decline in feeling of general well-being. Many men are estimated to have low T. Approximately 4 in 10 men over the age of 45 may have low testosterone, and that percentage gets higher as you get older. And low testosterone is more common in men who are obese, diabetic, have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, than in men without those conditions. Some signs and symptoms of low T include things like fatigue, loss of energy, decreased muscle mass and strength, increased body fat, loss of hair or reduced need to shave, decreased physical or work performance, high flashes, sweats, feeling sad or blue, less motivation or drive to do things, less self-confidence and enthusiasm, poor concentration and poor memory. Uh, don't forget reduced sex drive or libido and erectile dysfunction. Now, if you are diagnosed with low T, there are available treatment options that you can discuss with your healthcare professional. And these would include testosterone in gels. That's usually where I go first for uh, patients of mine who have low T. You can also try patches, oral medications, much less common in this country, um, and injections. Erectile dysfunction and prostate cancer treatment are very, very closely uh, related. We commonly see erectile dysfunction as a result of prostate cancer treatment. The nerves that provide stimulation for an erection lie very close to the prostate and may be injured during prostate cancer treatment. And I'm going to use the mouse. Let's see if this works. I'm going to try to highlight where it is on the slide right there. If you can see the pointer, that's where the nerves to the prostate are. Okay, prostate's right here. Nerves are right here. So when the prostate's removed, this is now the prostate gone, nerves have been damaged here. Now, even in nerve sparing prostatectomies, you still run the risk of nerve damage and prostate cancer treatments can affect a man's ability to get an erection on a temporary or permanent basis. Sexual dysfunction after prostate cancer treatment is very, very common. Overall, erectile dysfunction affects 25 to 75% of men who've been treated for prostate cancer. Erectile dysfunction as a result of prostate cancer surgery, robot-assisted radical prostatectomy, 10 to 46% of men one year after surgery had ED. And I'll tell you, I, I suspect that the number is higher than that. And I'll tell you one reason why I think that is patients like to make their doctors feel better. And that's true. So if someone asks their patient, you know, six months after surgery, how are the erections? That patient might feel bad saying that, you know, they're not having any. So what I commonly see is they'll say, well, oh, they're okay. I always like to poke them and say, really? I make them look me in the eye and tell me they're fine before I believe it. Sexual dysfunction after radiation also affects up to 50% of men. So there's no free lunch here. Radiation or surgery, just assume that the erections are not going to be the same. Thankfully, there are a number of erectile restoration treatment options. So who can treat erectile dysfunction? Well, a family physician or a primary care physician is a doctor with a general understanding of ED and is able to prescribe medical treatment options like your Viagra, Cialis, Stendra, Levitra, etc. A urologist is a specialist who's focused on diseases of the male and female urinary tract systems and the male reproductive organs. And a prosthetic urologist or an ED specialist has additional training specific to men's health and erectile dysfunction and specializes in the penile implant procedure. So these are your treatment options. Oral medications, penile injections, penile implants, vacuum erection devices, and the urethral suppositories. Now oral medications represent your first line of therapy. These work by increasing blood flow to the penis, which may then improve the ability to get erections and maintain them until sexual intercourse is successfully completed. And this requires sexual stimulation, 
Usually you take them within an hour before anticipated sexual activity. They will typically work for about four hours or so, with a notable exception being Cialis, which lasts for up to 36 hours. You're not supposed to take them more than once a day. And some oral medications efficacy can be affected by food. That's why if you have your Big Mac and then pop a Viagra, that Viagra is not going to work so great. So how effective are they? Well, they work for about 50 to 85% of men. But almost half of men with ED after prostate surgery stop taking the pills, and it's not because their ED has gotten better. It's because the pills aren't working. Men with diabetes are one and a half to two times more likely to move on to other treatments again because the pills aren't working for them. Common side effects include things like headache, facial flushing, stuffy nose, upset stomach. You want to talk to your doctor if sex is inadvisable because of cardiovascular status. I always ask my patients, I say, hey, look, can you walk up two flights of stairs? Can you walk a mile without keeling over? If the answer is no, you're not starting these. Now, if you're on an alpha blocker, generally you should be stable on that therapy before starting an oral medication for ED. And if you take nitrates, you cannot combine those with PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra and Cialis. That could be potentially fatal. You want to tell your doctor, obviously, if you've had any heart problems, stroke, low or high blood pressure, or if you've ever had liver or kidney problems. Next up is the vacuum erection device, or the VED. This is a very simple tool. And I do recommend this to all of my patients who come to me with ED, just because it's not a medication, it's not a surgery, it's something really easy to use at home. You see if you like it. If you like it, great. If you don't, you move on. It's a hollow plastic tube that's placed over the penis. The pump that can be hand or battery powered is used to create a vacuum that pulls blood into the penis. Once an erection is achieved, an elastic tension ring is placed at the base of the penis to help maintain the erection. Patient satisfaction rates range from 68 to 80%. It's pretty high. But despite the initial high success rate in one study, 86% of patients decided to move on to other sexual aids. And let's talk about why. Most common side effects include blocked ejaculation. That's no fun. Bruising of the penis, penile discomfort, penile numbness or coldness. And the most common reasons for discontinuation include things like erections of insufficient rigidity or duration, difficult mechanics, penile bruising, and lack of spontaneity. And in my practice, it's typically the lack of spontaneity that is the deal breaker with this sort of thing. Next up is the urethral suppository. Uh, and this is a medication that's administered by inserting the applicator stem into the urethra after urination. That's right, you put this medication in the pee hole. Onset of erection is within five to 10 minutes. You're supposed to refrigerate the suppository prior to use. How effective is it? In clinical literature, success rates are reported at 40 to 65%. And in 40 to 50% of men don't continue using this therapy after six to eight months. Most common side effects include pain in the penis, urethra, or testes, urethral pain or burning, low blood pressure, dizziness. Most common reasons for discontinuation include insufficient erections, suitable for intercourse, and urethral pain or burning. Next up is intracavernous injection therapy. Now, this is where most patients in my practice uh, will move on to if the pills are not working for them. Now, this does work really quite well. Self-injection uh, medication is placed directly into the corpora cavernosa. That's the erectile tissue in the penis. So that means you're injecting the penis with a small amount of medication. It's a very small needle. Use approximately, uh, so approximately 60% of patients are satisfied and continued use. However, despite success rates in a study of 254 men, only 20% continue the therapy. Most common side effects include penile pain, penile fibrosis or scar tissue, priapism or prolonged erection, and the blood collection under the skin at the injection site, also known as a hematoma. Most common reasons for discontinuation include unsatisfactory erections, pain, or dislike of injections. And then we have the penile implant. This is a pair of cylinders implanted in the penis. A pump is placed inside the scrotum, and a reservoir of saline is placed in the lower abdomen, right next to where the bladder is typically. Squeezing and releasing the pump moves fluid into the cylinders, creating an erection. Then you deflate the device by pressing the deflate button on the pump. The penis then returns to a soft, flaccid, and natural-looking state. 
It's very effective. 98% of patients reported erections to be excellent or satisfactory. And at seven years, 94% are still in use and free of revision. Some common side effects include post-op genital pain, mechanical malfunction, including autoinflation, and infection. You know, a couple of things with the post-operative genital pain, you know, this is for the most part, part of the rehab process, you have to get used to having that device in the body. And I tell all my patients who are considering getting a penile implant, uh, I say, look, you know, a lot of guys do fine, but you have to have the mentality, no pain, no gain. Okay. And again, in terms of mechanical malfunction, well, it's a mechanical device like your car. Your car can break down. These can break down. However, like it said, I expect the vast majority of the implants that I place to be in good working order after 10 years. And now we have an educational video, but again, I'm going to give the following warning. This contains educational content that may be considered graphic and viewer discretion is advised. So here you can see the device is completely concealed within the body. Pumping the pump, pumping the bulb part of the pump will transfer fluid from the reservoir into the cylinders. And then pressing or squeezing on the button above the bulb will return the fluid from the cylinders back into the reservoir. Now the penile implant is designed as a permanent solution to ED. It's very spontaneous. You can have sex when the mood strikes. Erection can, as la can last as long as you desire and it's entirely contained inside the body. No one has to know that you have one unless you tell them. And I, I have patients who swear their partners don't know that they have it. There is very high patient and partner satisfaction. And I'm, I'm gonna give you a little anecdote. Just the, um, just the other week, I had a lovely couple uh, in my office, who is getting ready to celebrate uh, uh, a, uh, a wedding anniversary? They've been together for decades, and um, and they had uh, they had just gotten the implant. They right, he had gotten the implant. It was really for them, right? But he's the one with the implant. Um, he had just gotten it a few months ago, and they had started using it. And they came into my office for a post op, and they were all smiles. They were so happy. They said, "It's like you've given us our 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 youth back." They said, "It's like we're kids again." I mean, they they had been together since you know either their late teens or early twenties, and it was it was it was a very lovely thing to see. It's very gratifying when when you see these relationships that are are enhanced by by a return of this kind of intimacy. Um, and typically it does not interfere with ejaculation or orgasm and implants have been in use for more than 40 years. You know, I had a patient a couple of years ago, uh, who I was discussing the implant with him and, uh, you know, I showed him some pictures of it and he was blown away. I think he was an engineer. Um, and, uh, he, he looked at this and he said, is this new? How come I've never heard about this? Uh, he was very psyched and he did actually end up getting an implant and did really quite well. Um, and that's something that still, I don't know that it surprises me, but I, I, I find it very informative that most men don't know about this and it's been around for decades and it works great. I mean, look, it's a surgery, it's a device you're putting in the body. It's not something to be taken lightly, but it is such a great alternative for a lot of guys. Um, and it, it just is still striking to me that even after 40 years, it's not more widely known. Nearly 500,000 patients have been treated with the penile implant to date. Now, insurance, insurance coverage cannot be guaranteed, and Medicare and most private insurance companies cover a penile implant procedure, but we can't really guarantee individual coverage. So you want to work with your doctor's office and your insurance provider to check coverage levels prior to receiving treatment. But don't let coverage stand in your way. If you have private insurance and a high deductible, or if this is an excluded benefit, you still may be eligible for financial assistance and your doctor can provide more information. Now what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give a shout out to my surgical scheduler, Kathy. She is fantastic. Um, 
she she works very very hard to get all of our procedures approved, not just these, but but all of our surgical procedures. And uh, what I'll tell you is, and again, I'm not making any guarantees for future performance, but what I'll tell you is that in my experience, we have never had a denial for a penile implant. Uh, we've had denials for other things, but not for this. And that's all, Kathy. Now, penile implants are a surgical procedure, and there are, of course, possible risks. There are risks involved with any surgery, and not all patients are candidates for a penile implant. So you want to discuss all the risks and benefits of this procedure in more detail with your doctor. Now, some risks include that it's going to make natural spontaneous erections as well as other interventional treatment options impossible. Once you go to the implant, you're not going back to injections after that. You're not going back to Viagra after you do the implant. There may be mechanical failure of the implant, which may require revision surgery. You may have pain, which is typically associated with the healing process. And men with diabetes, spinal cord injuries, or open sores may have an increased risk of infection. For more information, visit www.hartfordedcure.com. Come and see me, Dr. Gerard Pregenzer Jr., if you'd like. I will uh, make a plug for our telemedicine services. Again, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to learn to think outside the box, and we are fully prepared to see patients uh, in a telemedicine format. Uh, we can see new patients. We can see follow-ups. Just because you're advised to stay home doesn't mean that you can't get some help. So give us a call. Schedule an appointment if you want one. I'm happy to help you. If you want to take a screenshot of these references so you can look them up yourselves, I applaud you. And that's the end of the slide deck. So I'm going to open this up to questions, which I think can be put in the comment section. And I'm going to have someone transmit them to me. This is usually where there's some silence. You know, what I'll say is, um, you know, one of the experiences that, I, that I've that i noticed is, uh, you know, guys coming in, sometimes they'll have a, uh, a reluctant partner, um, or at least a seemingly reluctant partner. And what I will relate to you is a common occurrence that I've seen. Uh, you know, I'll have, uh, uh, you know, a, a man and his partner, uh, and typically it's his wife, and, um, you know, you know, he'll, he'll be interested in the implant and, and she won't want to have anything to do with it. And she'll say, oh, it's fine. It's fine. We don't have to do this. He doesn't have to do this. I, I, I don't know why we're, why, why, why we're here. We're fine. We're fine. Um, and, uh, and, uh, what I find is that in the guys who do end up going through with this, uh, usually what happens is that uh, their partner will change their outlook afterwards. And it turns out that it's not that the partner didn't care uh, about the, uh, about, about their, their man's situation is that they cared so much. Uh, you know, they, they, they love their man so much that they didn't want to see him possibly be disappointed again by another, uh, another possible intervention that might not work. And uh, what I see is, 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 again, these people, they have their lives back. Um, you know, I had one, uh, another lovely couple that uh, I, 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 I implanted a couple of years ago now, a uh, very lovely Spanish-speaking couple. And uh, I remember they were in, and one of my medical assistants helps to translate for me. And, uh, you know, she was telling me that the wife was so happy. She said that she felt like she had, uh, she had her husband back from how he was when he was 18 again, and not because of the sex, but because, you know, prior to addressing his erectile uh, issues effectively, he was, he was very depressed. She said he was impossible to be around, and now that he's able to perform like he wants to, um, you know, uh, 
you know, now now it's like they're they're back to the way that they were. All right, so I have a couple of questions here. So infection rates. So, you know, infection rates. Uh, you know, this this varies. Uh, you know, honestly, from uh, from implanter to implanter, you know, typically you expect uh, less than one percent, one percent or less, typically in your non-diabetic patient. Uh, diabetics generally uh, are are higher, generally around the one to two percent. Uh, that's for what we call your virgin implants. So the implants. Uh, uh, you know, not not a revision. So infection rates go up if uh, infection rates go up if you have uh, if you have to do what's called a revision. So let's say you have a device that breaks down after 15 years or whatever it might be, and you go in to replace it. You're going to have a higher infection risk uh, than putting a, a first implant in. Uh, let me see here. I have another question here. Are there patients of mine that are willing to discuss the surgery from a patient's perspective? Absolutely. And uh, I didn't ask to give their names out like uh, tonight, but um, uh, you know, I have a number of patients who actually come to me or have come to me and volunteer, and they said that they want to be part of the solution uh, for for these men who suffered like they did. And one of the common uh, comments that I have from guys is that they wish that there had been somebody uh, to talk to them about this years ago. And probably the most common regret that I hear from guys is that they waited as long as they did. And uh, so a lot of these guys become... Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's like they're, they're, they're warriors for this. They want to be out there. They want to be out in the community. They want to tell their friends. I have guys who go around and tell their friends about their implants and say, Hey, look, you got to go and you got to get this taken care of. Um, it, it, it's very impressive. And uh, I have a number of guys who say, yeah, give my cell phone number out and, uh, or, 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 or they'll call patients for me. Yeah. The patients want that. Uh, let me see here. What else? I've got another couple of questions here. How long until you can use the implant? What's recovery like? So what's recovery like? So I tell guys, look, it's 50-50, right? So half the guys that I implant, they do great even you know, after a couple of days. They maybe take a couple of ibuprofen and they have a great healing process uh, with almost no pain. I have other guys, and it tends to be the guys who have had diabetes for a while who do have a more difficult time getting through that post-op recovery period just from the discomfort. So we'll do things like uh, like high-dose non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, or other medications to help control the pain, but it goes away. Uh, how long does it take for it to go away? You know, anywhere from, you know, a week, a couple weeks. Uh, I've had some guys, it, the, the rare exception is the guy who has discomfort for a couple of months. Okay, but those are out there. They're out there. They're in the minority, but they're out there. Most guys do pretty well after a couple of weeks. And when can you use it? That's always the question. So first off, don't use it the night you go home, okay? Don't do that. Uh, so uh, I tell most guys, if it's an uncomplicated uh, implantation, typically you can use it within about four weeks. Uh, and I feel very comfortable with that. Some guys, uh, for whatever reason, I feel more comfortable making it six weeks. Basically, you can use it when I say you can use it, but it generally is about four to six weeks. And how much does insurance cover? That is a great question. And that would be between you and your insurance carrier, I would suspect. Um, you know, again, some people will have a deductible or a copay. Um, you know, but again, you know, these are issues that my office uh, is happy to help uh, work with patients and their insurance to try to to try to make this a reality for people. You know, I have some people ask me, uh, you know, does this uh, affect a man's ability to urinate? The the answer is no. It actually. The, um, the cylinders, I'm going to see if I can do this on the camera. So the cylinders sort of sit up here, and the urethra is like is like underneath. So my thumb right there is the urethra underneath the cylinders, okay? And so there is no, uh, there is no interference typically. How long does the implant last? Uh, so most, again, most of them are in good working order for greater than 10 years. I had one gentleman who came in to see me. This was uh, back when I first started in practice. I had one gentleman who came in to see me because he had had his implant placed like 15 years ago. And he had heard that they were only supposed to be good for whatever he said, 10, 12 years. And he said, you know, do, do I need to worry about it? And I said, is it working? And he said, yes. I said, come back and see me when it's not working. And he hasn't come back. So I'm assuming you know, that that'll be about 18, 19 years now. So some of them last quite a while. 
Well, I have normal sensation. Uh, so the expectation is that patients will have uh, the same sensation after the surgery as they did before. Uh, you know, the ejaculation, the orgasm should be the same. When we place this device, we don't go anywhere near where the muscles are that control the contraction of orgasm. Uh, so that should be completely not uh, not involved. Now, some guys will ask me, um, you know, they'll they'll they'll, they'll ask me. You know, will they will they still feel aroused when they see a, a pretty woman? And it's hard to know how to answer that question. Um, you know, what I'll say is that we, when we put this implant in, we are replacing the normal erectile tissue. Okay, so um, you know, you're not going to have the sensation of let's say blood rushing into the penis. But you know, supposedly, if you're at the point where you're going to get a penile implant, you're not feeling that sensation anyway. Um, but this does not affect libido. Certainly, it does not affect it in a negative way. If anything, on a psychological basis, it could improve it just because you'll have the confidence of knowing that you will be able to get an erection when you want to have an erection. All right, so it looks like that's all we have for questions. I'm just going to put this up here again. So you all can come and visit me at www.hartfordedcure.com. Again, that's for ED Specialists of Connecticut. That's a division of the Greater Hartford Urology Group. That's a full-service urology group. We provide services for all areas of urology. ED specialist specifically focuses on ED. Uh, and this is part of Prime Healthcare. And again, telephone number is 860-522-2251. Again, 860-522-2251. And I believe that we actually have, it looks like there's one more question coming in. Let me see if I can pull that up. How long after surgery until I can go back to work? I guess my question is, what do you do for work? Uh, if you sit at a computer like this right now and, uh, and, and, and work like this, or if you work from home, well, you could probably go back to work uh, you know, the following week. If you're lifting something heavy, don't do that for like two weeks, okay? No heavy lifting for two weeks. And in fact, I really want you on your back for about three days after you've had the surgery done. Um, but again, it's really highly dependent on what it is that you do for work. And I, I have a very individualized, tailored discussion with each one of my patients about those specific concerns. Do all urologists do penile implants? Uh, so no, they don't. And I, I mean, look, from my perspective, I think more should. Again, I think that not enough people know about implants. I think part of that is because, uh, you know, more urologists don't do them. Uh, there's something to be said for being a high volume implanter. Um, you know, thankfully I, 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 I do a sufficient number of implants to be considered a high volume implanter. And I think that that affects your technique. I think that it helps you to, um, to, to do a better job if you do a lot of these, but, uh, I, you know, if anything, I think there should be more implants out there, not not fewer just because it works so great. And I see a lot of guys suffer needlessly without having this treated properly. Uh, but to answer that question, do all urologists do penile implants? Uh, no. Um, you know, so you want to ask around and you want to make sure that if you are finding someone to help you with this, that they, that they do a certain number. And I'm going to put this up here again one more time. So that's my current office location, number nine, Cranbrook Boulevard, second floor. It's a beautiful new building. Come and visit us uh, up in Enfield, Connecticut. Phone number 860-522-2251. I'm just going to check with my production assistant here and see if, uh, if there's anything else or if we should be signing off. All right, gentlemen, 
Well, thank you for attending and uh, seeing our very first live stream. I promise it won't be the last. I hope that you had fun. Uh, come and join us again sometime.